Dominic Carosa is either very smart or very lucky. In 2000, right before the dot-com crash, he listed the technology company and somehow still survived the tech wreck. Last year, some thought his luck had run out when he got caught up with the Opus Prime collapse and lost his company, Destra. Rather than give up, he's back in business, taking the very hard lessons he's learned along the way to help other tech startups. Dominic Carosa joins me now in the studio. Dom, thanks for joining us. Good evening, Peter. Now, Dom, why don't you tell us the, the story of how you got Destra publicly listed? Uh, well, it actually started uh, at the age of five when uh, I started selling postcards at the front of my house. Um, back then I was selling uh, one postcard for one cent or two postcards or three postcards for two cents and uh, back then my, my core objective and my core ROI was uh, buying a bag of lollies. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm happy to say I progressed from, from lollies and uh, in the 90s we got involved in uh, computer software and internet and uh, then uh, towards 98, 99 we started the uh, listing process and mm. ended up listing in uh, May 2000. Uh, as you know, right after the dot-com crash. That's right. And, uh, but you got through that, didn't you? You limped your way through that sort of thing. I remember you once telling me that one of the worst things you have to do was have to you know, reduce your staff. Yeah, we, um, we listed in May and uh, January 2001, a, a day I called Black Monday, uh, we had to uh, effectively retrench almost half of the team. And, and that was one of the uh, most difficult decisions I've ever had to make. But what it in fact did was save the company. Mm. Um, we then ended up building the second largest virtual web hosting company in Australia, mm. uh, which we ended up selling into another float for $19 million, and then reinvested that cash back into building uh, what Destra was, uh, was the largest independent media and entertainment company. Okay, so, so Destra, one of your, 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 like the website was MP3. So why don't you, why don't you explain to us what MP3 did? Uh, well, MP3, um, which we launched in, um, in 1999, is a generic term for digital music. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw that the music industry was changing, people were starting to consume more content, whether mm -hmm. it's music or video content, mm -hmm. over the internet. And so we registered the domain name and we basically built a website that allowed artists to cut out the middleman, cut out the middle person, the record company, mm -hmm. and go direct to the, to the consumers. So who were your rivals? You were number three in Australia, weren't you? But who, who, were, the, who were the one and two? Uh, well, we, um, in relation to um, mp3.com today, we were the largest independent music website in the country. Right. Um, we had the major record companies that... Like Sony and whatever. Yeah, yeah. that we were... Initially, uh, we were butting heads with the record companies mm -hmm. uh, because they thought that MP3 was the Antichrist and, it, and uh, what they've done eight years later is finally embraced the technology and digital music. And uh, I'm afraid that the video industry, the big studios globally, mm -hmm. are now starting to repeat the same mistakes that the music companies made in 99, 2000. What's that mistake? Well, in my view, the digital content genie is already out of the bottle, and it has been for many years. Mm. And what the record companies try to do was control how consumers could access and view content. Mm. And so, so this is like a, a tech -o argument that nerds, you know, high-tech nerds like you really get into. There is, a, and I say with the greatest respect on me, <laughs> as you know, I would, but this has a share market implication on all the companies that are getting it wrong right now. And I'm, I'm thinking about media companies and newspapers and stuff like that. What do you think the, the media world's getting right and wrong now? Wrong, I guess, is probably the most important well, thing for it, investors. If I look at the major record companies or the major content companies, um, I would say that News Corp mm -hmm. is definitely at... I wouldn't say the forefront, but definitely leading. Uh, they released a, a video on demand platform out of the US last year called Hulu.com, mm. which basically made all of their content av available online and usually free for consumers. Mm. Um, Apple is doing great things out there, bringing content in an easy fashion, in, in an easy way to use um, to consumers. Mm. Uh, but if I was a traditional company, still selling traditional advertising you know, through physical media, mm. Right now, I would be afraid, very afraid. Okay, so let's just talk about your company for a moment because Destra um, was a public listed company. Um, you were getting a lot of support, uh, if I remember right, was it Prime? Uh, Prime Media and Lachlan Murdoch were our two major shareholders. Yeah, two major shareholders, and they, they thought you were heading in the right direction. Then you go to bed one night and you wake up to the news that you'd lost your company. Uh, well, basically, it, it actually happened uh, in two tranches. Um, uh, March 2008, I woke up one day and Opus Prime uh, had 
basically went into VA. And uh, I, like many CEOs, believed in, in what we were doing at Destra. Mm. Uh, I had all of my shares within Opus Prime, which allowed me to buy more Destra shares, mm. exercise all Margin my options, mm. Uh, mm. And, uh, which I know is something that you've spoken about quite extensively. Mm. And so I was effectively highly geared on Destro mm. because I, I love you're that You're young, company. you're groovy, you have to be highly geared. Yeah. We, we know. That was, yeah. the, that was the sort of thing you guys did in those days. Yeah. Uh, uh, undoubtedly. Yeah. And so I ended up losing all of my equity, which was a kick in the guts. Mm. And then um, uh, three, four weeks later, Prime Media, who was our major shareholder, increased their stake to 44%. Mm. And uh, as we know, when a, a large corporate effectively controls a smaller organisation, there's no room for an entrepreneurial CEO. So it was my time to go. Mm. Um, so that was a definitely, a, that was actually in fact harder to leave the company that I co-founded than losing you know, X millions of dollars uh, mm. in Opus Prime. Yeah, and entrepreneurs often don't fit into publicly listed companies when they get to that stage. Now what's happened with you and Destra since then? Uh, well, I've uh, ended up, I, as soon as when I left Destra um, in April last year, I set up uh, Dominant Digital, which is a, an investment company with the support of some ex Destra shareholders. Mm. And, uh, and so we've gone out there and we actually bought back some Destra assets. Um, we've now got about $5 million of assets under management. Mm. And uh, our core focus is we invest in internet upstarts. Uh, so that is internet companies that have been around for 12 to 36 months. Mm highly scalable, low touch, and you'll love this, they make money while you sleep. Mm, yes, that's the kind of business we all like to invest in. <laughs> so in, in terms of um, the businesses out there that you like, can you give us some classic examples, even public listed companies you think are getting this new um, uh, media world right? Um, the kinds of um, internet companies that we're quite bullish on, um, not only the ones that you know, we own in our own portfolio, but um, you know, the seeks and the what ifs of the world. Mm. And when I talk about a highly scalable business model, um, we, you know, what that effectively means for us is I can double the revenue in the company and I only need to increase expenses at a smaller proportion. I don't need to double the headcount. Mm. So it's a very high, it's a highly scalable model. And, uh, and, and what we see today, um, I mean, we, we just bought an asset about six weeks ago, mm. uh, just over one times EBIT. So this financial crisis um, that people talk about and a lot of people putting their head in the sand is a great opportunity for our fund because we're able to go out there and acquire assets at a fraction of the price um, as compared to what they were worth a couple of years ago. OK, let's talk about conventional television stations because lots of people who watch this program could be holding PBL and Seven and whatever. What do they have to do to reinvent themselves in this changing world? I believe it's inherently very hard for a traditional media company, you know, a TV station, to try and reinvent themselves. Not because they don't have the ability or the financial capability to do so, but because they've got one foot stuck in the old world while, and they're trying to effectively protect their revenue and their existing assets mm. and they've got one foot in the new economy world. Mm. And there's very much a balancing act while what we try and do is focus on internet companies that are solely focused on the new economy. And so that way they're not even considering how companies did things in the past um, or trying to protect anything, they're just focused and looking towards the future. But it sounds as though they have to succumb to the generation wide demands for we want it, we want it now, and give it to me as quick as you can. Uh, the, you know, the instant gratification generation is, is what I call them, and, and I'm slightly, you know, Gen X, so I'm slightly mm. out of that generation. They actually want content now. And, and, and my view of the future is that more and more content will be given away for free, but will be wrapped in advertising. Mm. And the traditional 30 second spot, in my view, is dying. And, and in the AFR today, they, um, there was an article on TiVo. Uh, which is Channel 7 sort of foreplay, uh, and uh, one of the interesting things in there, a lot more people now are starting to skip adverts. Mm. So 30 second adverts are becoming a lot less relevant. So it has to be embedded. Dominic, thanks for joining us. We're out of time, but thanks for joining us on Switzer. Thank you. Cheers, mate.